Welcome to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman alongside Morgan Campbell. Morgan, go ahead and ring that bell. Ooh, the hammer's stuck this week. Oh, man. Listen, I, I can only hope that this week we have as much fun as Justin Bieber and Floyd Mayweather seem to be having on their vacation in Bora Bora. They seem to be having a great time. Justin gets to sing his own songs at karaoke while Floyd just claps the rhythm in the back. (laughs) Well, I have noticed on Instagram that Mayweather's back uh, on the continent because I guess his second career is just going to be... App startup brand ambassador. So yes. there was the the video of him on Instagram playing Mike Tyson's Punch Out <laughs> on video, and it was uh you know the, the the borders of the video were really fuzzy. Yeah, and then there was the white the 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 white letters and numbers, and he's saying in the in the caption, "Hey, download this app. It'll make your Instagram videos look like they were filmed on a camcorder." So this is this is the the, the sportonomics of Mayweather's second career, I guess. But so you didn't point out that he's playing Mike Tyson's Punch Out in yes. that video. Uh, and he still loses. He gets knocked out by Mike Tyson. Even Floyd Mayweather can't beat Mike Tyson in that game. I think that accurately portrayed everyone's <laughs> frustration in trying to beat Mike Tyson with Little Mac. I never got to Mike Tyson. I think the farthest I ever got was uh, King Hippo. Who comes after King Hippo? I forget who comes. Is it uh, Piston Honda? No, no. Piston Honda's, Honda's early, early on, yeah. So yeah. it's the guy after King. I beat King okay. Hippo one time, and then that was that. That's, that's never too, got too hard. Yes. Floyd can't do it, and, you know. Floyd's the best ever, right? You know, exactly. exactly. Right, so. TVE. All right, uh, coming up this weekend, we have a, a very busy weekend uh, in boxing, but uh, most of the eyes are going to be on the HBO pay-per-view on Saturday night. Gennady Golovkin taking on uh, David Lemieux in a mouth-watering uh, middleweight matchup that can only end in one way, yes. that cannot be boring in any way. Uh, we'll get into discussion about the fight in just a second, but we have to talk about the build-up to the fight of because course. HBO, of course, gave us a face-to-face episode. Yes. Which with Golovkin and with David Lemieux, of course, with Max Kellerman sitting in between them and their trainers as well. Um, you know, first things first, I, I, I do want to point out that we've got a little bit of backlash on this show, and it seems to all be from fans of Triple G or Vasily Lomachenko. <laughs> I, 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 listen, you know, I, don't, I don't read YouTube comments. Yeah, I'll occasionally you know, glance in, at them. In, yeah. in uh, that Macklemore song, he says, well, if I was gay, I would think, you, hip-hop hates me. Right. <laughs> Haven't you read the YouTube comments lately? And I'm like, who the hell? Macklemore, don't read YouTube comments. Yeah. Well, you know, well, we had a, we, we had the one guy tweeting at us. One, remember, we're, uh, we're ignoramuses. I miss that guy. No, you, you sent it to me, the guy that told us to get a globe. I think we have a globe sitting over there because we were apparently, you know, jokingly said that all <laughs> fighters are from Russia when they're not actually from Russia. I th- and I think we had pointed out, too, that... We realize that yes. all the quote unquote Russians are We're not saying that other show. people are saying that. Yeah. So just to make that clear and just to make this clear. Yes. Triple G is one of the five best boxers on the planet. Yep. There is no hatred towards Triple G on this program whatsoever. At the same time, I'm not going to come on this program and tell you fairy tales uh, about these fighters. You know, the, the Kurt Hennig version <laughs> of Triple G that is being portrayed by HBO uh, is ridiculous. And, and it sort of, it really carried into, not sort of, it really carried into the face-to-face episode where Max Kellerman basically, you know tries to egg Triple G on to tell people that he intentionally lets these fight fights go on longer than they actually do, uh, which is preposterous. No one does that. Well, there's a couple things. One, the, the whole face-to-face format works best when the fighters are actually face-to-face. So when you have... Max Kellerman, two fighters and two trainers. You don't have face to face anymore. You have a round table because mm-hmm. those two guys can't sit at a five guys can't sit at a table like this. You and I are face to face. Yes, but if we have each of us has a retinue of people <laughs> and then you know some moderator, it's not the same. And and the thing is, they still sit with the backwards chairs because that's supposed to make things seem informal. But the chairs get like fancier every time and higher backed every time, and you're kind of ruining the formality, the informality that the backwards chair is supposed to impart when you have more people, bigger table, and fancier chairs. Now you just look like you're at a boardroom and you don't see like board meetings taking place with people in backwards chairs. No. Like, hey man, what's We just watched the press conference. Right. And the, 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 the drama in a face-to-face setting like that is again, when the fighters are indeed face-to-face and they're not that far apart and there's nothing separating them except their self-control and Max Kellerman. And you don't get the sense that Max Kellerman is a strong enough guy to keep two fighters apart that really want to punch each other out right now. So when you look at um, the previous incarnations of it, 
the best ones are when the guys address each other and not Max. Yep. And when they talk about each other, the best one was probably um. Cota Margarito was really good. Cota. David Hay, Vladimir Klitschko was ex- yes. especially good. And um, Pascal versus Hopkins. Hop- yes, Pascal and, Hopkins was and, fantastic. And Pascal keeps banging on the. I'm going to beat you, Bernard. Yes. <laughs> Hopkins says, you're not going to beat up anything but that table. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's drama, which is different from if they're each talking to Max, saying, hey, Max, I think I'm better than him. No, Max, I'm better than him. That's not exciting. Yeah, well, and, and there, it, it also is more exciting when there is some animosity between the fighters. We yes. didn't really have that this time. They seemed to be quite respectful of one another. Right. So instead, uh, this was d- an infomercial for Triple G, really. Yes. The vast majority of that program was directed towards Triple G. And to go back to what I was saying, it, you have Max basically saying, hey, you uh, you know, you take some punches for fun, right? You know, just because the fans are like that. Yes. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Well, and Triple G at this point now is going along with it. Yeah, hey, I, I love taking pun. You love taking pun. Yeah, I love taking punishment. Sure, because it's a fight. It's not a game. I guess. And you know, we went over this last week. For whatever, defensive fighters are are, are now passe because racism is over. Um, and now this Mexican style <laughs> of fighting that. Which was dropped in there, by the way. We had the, to, had to yeah, say Mexican exactly. style in there. Yeah. The Mexican style of fighting that's only been popularized in the last two years by our friend from Kazakhstan. Uh, that's where it's at. And that means you take a few punches to make the other guy feel good, apparently. But, you know, I agree with you on that. I don't, when Golovkin gets hit, it's just because he's getting hit because it is boxing. And it's okay for him to get hit. Everyone gets hit. Even great defensive fighters get hit because it's boxing. And you don't have to – when someone gets hit, you don't have to make an excuse for him. Or make up a story for him or or sell this story to him to then sell to the public that he's doing this on purpose just to make the opponent feel comfortable. It's boxing. People get hit. hit. Relax. But this is part of, too, uh, part of building up Golovkin and selling him to the mainstream sports sure. public. Sure. He can stop a fight at any time. Necessarily right. involves making him not just a great fighter but a Superman. But the problem with that is that um, you know, no one's perfect in any sport. Now I've told these people who never watch boxing that here comes this guy who never gets hit except when he invites it, um, can knock down walls, can do everything, and end any fight at any moment. And then the fight comes along, and even if it's an exciting fight, if it winds up being competitive, uh, you have Golovkin now not living up to the expectations uh, that the people hyping him have set. Sure. And it, it, that makes Golovkin's job much tougher when he's supposed to be uh, the next superstar. But you haven't just hold, sold him as a superstar. You've sold him as a superhuman, which no one is. Right. And, and, and the story being told is that apparently he does this. You know, he intentionally takes punches. Or in the example they were giving, that he let Willie Monroe get some offense off in the middle rounds so that future opponents yes. would be less afraid of him and so that he could entice someone like David Lemieux uh, to get in the ring yes. with him. Are you telling me that if he would have just starched Willie Monroe in the first round, which apparently he can do at any time, yes. that David Lemieux you would have then looked and said, mm, I don't think so. I don't think I'm going to fight Triple G. I think this fight would have happened either way. Well, the other thing is if 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 Golovkin says, actually, yeah, none of these guys actually hit me. I just let them do it because I want to carry him, carry my opponents to trick other people into fighting me. Well, then the trick is done because now, right. you're, because now you've told everyone, actually, no, I'm better than you think I am. I'm, I'm not as flawed as you think I am. Um, so if you're scared to fight me before, you're going to be scared to fight me again. Um, and the other part I thought was interesting, too, because let's remember how, how Manny Pacquiao became Manny Pacquiao, right? Was that he beat, Oscar, he beat, he beat the tar out of Oscar De yeah. Hoya. But he was this little guy who beat up bigger guys. But at the same time, no matter how savagely he beat people, like he never came across as a violent person or as a hateful person, even if you said hateful things to him or hateful things about him like Mayweather did. He was a guy that enjoyed boxing um, but didn't necessarily enjoy hurting people. Whereas Max Kellerman, he he goes into this extended uh, retelling of the story of the fight with Curtis <laughs> Stevens. And he said, you let the fight go on. Did you enjoy hurting him? Huh? Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy it? <laughs> And Golovkin, you, you enjoyed hurting him, didn't you? He's a good interrogator. Yeah. Well, right. So you killed him, didn't you? <laughs> well, right. <laughs> Admit it. So now we have again a, a public that has an insatiable appetite for violent sport, but needs kind of like a veneer between us and the violence. So, like in football, they wear the padding 
and they throw the ball. Oh, yeah, we like the throwing. We like the spectacular plays. We don't tune in. No, you tune in for the violence because if you liked people running fast, you would watch track and you don't watch track. But yeah. you watch, if you watch shot put, if you like guys throwing <laughs> the ball right. a javelin, long way. Listen, yeah, a javelin, javelin travels way They can the air football. those puppies out. Right. Yeah. They, <laughs> we like the violence, but we like to pretend that it's something other than the violence. Um, yet here we have Kellerman, I guess, thinking that packaging and selling Golovkin as a sadist <laughs> is going to help sell this fight. But then people like the violence. It's not violent. Like They like Manny Pacquiao because he was David beating Goliath, not because he was a man pummeling the sense exactly. of man, breaking people's orbital bones and stuff. That wasn't necessarily why they tuned in. He was David beating Goliath. But now they're saying, yeah, watch this man punish another man cause him physical pain not for sport but for enjoyment yes which is something different and again it's a different it's something self. different from the character they've been building up all this time yes. too the sweater wearing you know well, dude with a nice smile and a nice complexion well that's why i wore this sweater because as we said last week anytime you wear a sweater you're automatically a fan favorite who's a fan favorite that's this the, week this guy right there yes <laughs> right well uh let's be honest if you're tuning in if you're buying this pay-per-view on saturday you're probably doing so because you do want to watch a little violence so when we come back from the break we'll talk about the fight itself and uh, plenty more including the undercard which features chocolatito yes. who might be the best fighter in the world so stick with us we'll be right back on fight network boxing weekly Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman alongside Morgan Campbell. So we continue to get you set for a Triple G and David Lemieux at Madison Square Garden this Saturday night live on HBO Pay-Per-View. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about Triple G and in the, in the building up of the Triple G uh character, so to speak, in the first segment. Let's talk about David Lemieux, because I, I find it fascinating that suddenly he's been able to become uh, a marketable character, a yes. marketable fighter, because it was maybe two years ago, or th three years ago, but with it, you know, as, as recently as the last year and a half, I would yes. say, people had determined that David Lemieux was nothing but a hype job and was not worth their time. They didn't want to see him on television. And I, I never... I, I never really understood why uh, people didn't want to watch David Lemieux because even if he was flawed and, and even if he was hyped up too much in some way, for my money, David Lemieux has always been one of the more exciting fighters on the planet. Right. And David Lemieux has always, even if he had flaws in other areas, been one of the most dynamic offensive fighters in the sport. Yes. That has never changed. And now that he has some wins and has beaten some rep reputable guys, has gotten a little bit older, uh, may or may not have changed his style in any way whatsoever, but just got, got himself some wins. Now we've just forgotten. And some of the very same people have forgotten everything that they, that they said about David Lemieux before. And they view him as some sort of a challenge for triple G. I, I find it amusing. Well, it's strange that, even though boxing is like an absolutely open competition, like you and I can go get licenses right now yep. and go fight. Particularly in West Virginia. In West Virginia, Oklahoma, hung Hungary, yep. Latvia. Point is, the, the public and to a lesser extent the media treat boxing as if it's a big single elimination tournament. Um, so you lose one fight and people are like, well, you might as well retire. You lost one fight. You're not undefeated. Why should I take you seriously? You, you lost a fight. And then act like because you lost one fight that you should never fight again or whatever it was that led you to lose one fight or even two fights is absolutely um, incorrectable, right? So Lemieux lost. He lost two fights in a row. Lost to Rubio, lost to Joshi Masin. You know, and not guys you should lose to if you're uh, – on the Triple G level. Yeah. But he lost to them. But to your point, you know, he's built his record up since then. And the things that made him intriguing haven't gone away. Um, is he better than he was three years ago when he lost to Joshua Malsin? I would think so. Um, but maybe he's not. Honestly, but, maybe he's not because there haven't been visual uh, improvements that yes. we can see or any change to his style whatsoever. I mean, it would be uh, some people have tried to run with this idea that, oh, he's a better schooled fighter now or, you know, he's, he's more dedicated to the sport and whatnot. You know, those things may be true. Yes. I don't know. But when I, you know, I, I talked to Mark Ramsey and I asked him, you know, what, what did you change in David Lemieux? What, what prompted this turnaround, so to speak, if there was one? And he said, well, yeah, I tried to get him to use his jab a little bit more, but really 
really nothing's changed well, with right. him at all. So if the trainer doesn't think that David <laughs> is changing anything, uh, he really probably hasn't changed anything. But what he has, um, and what will always get you in the door, is the win over the common opponent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? He yep, had the yep. win over uh, uh, Gabe Rosado. Yes. Um, and I'm just, I had to go because I didn't have it off the top of my head, but Golovkin knocked him out in seven rounds. A few losses later, Lemieux comes around, knocks him out in 10 rounds. Mm -hmm. and says, okay, well, we have... And it doesn't matter that a lot of people beat Rosado in between then. Nobody's beat um, him in the pit, though. Well, exactly. Yeah, you can't beat him in the pit. Right. But he, they have the win over the common opponent, and this, you know, counts for a lot. And it doesn't matter that, that Rosado might have been a diminished fighter uh, from in between the Golovkin fight and the Lemieux fight. What you have is the win over the common opponent, um, and that's what legitimizes him you know as a threat and is he better than as i think he might be better than he was three years ago he might not be have the people he's fought between then and now really been good enough to been good enough to bring that out of him probably not but you know what he has is a belt and a win over a common opponent and a reputation a well-deserved reputation as a power puncher and whether or not he's any even like within three levels of Golovkin skill levels won't matter. Like that's not necessarily what gets you that fight. What gets you that fight is the credential and the perceived threat. And the perceived threat is better than a real one because the perceived threat you're not. It's a perceived threat is not real. Then the A side goes out and beats you, and then you say, "Ooh, yeah, he beat that guy who seemed to pose a big threat." Right, exactly. And that's perceived threats are what make you money. Yes, they they are what yeah, sell pay per views ahead of time, and they are what makes you money after the fact. Yes, because you don't get money to lose. No, most of us don't anyway. You know the the perceived threat again is that Lemieux is a great combination puncher and he has good power, um, arguably as powerful as Triple G. So this is going to be another test. For Triple G. And, you know, I never like to say that a fighter was exposed even when they lose or anything like that. Every fighter, um, as you said, there will be circumstances in every fight that might be unique to that particular fight. And they might never present themselves again. You can't really look at one fight, you know, under a lens and determine yes. one thing conclusively out of a, about a fighter. Um, there, I will say that recently... The performances from Triple G, they've all been impressive, but it's not like we've learned anything new no, about Triple G. It's been a lot of the same It's the fights. same thing. Now, yes. this one, in, in this fight, we might find out, hey, can Triple G take a punch? Yes. Can, you know, can he take a punch from an elite power puncher? Yes. Really the only fight in recent memory where we've had to learn anything about Triple G and what he can do, anything new, um, on a very small scale, is the Asamanu Adamu fight, because Adamu was able to at least make a move move around the ring and take him nine rounds right. and you found out that hey yes triple g does know how to cut off the ring you know right. you can't just run in barrel in and, and knock people out he actually had to move around mechanically and hunt him down i think this will be the next time on on saturday that we'll learn something about triple g yeah. and that will be about his durability yes because we've seen triple g take punches and regardless of what max hellerman says about triple g just taking punches uh, on purpose uh, to encourage prospective opponents. When you watch the fights play out, it's not always that way. It's just a guy getting hit in exchanges. He's not an airtight defensive fighter, but again, not a lot of people are. Um, and like a true airtight defensive fighter who's also aggressive, we can talk about him in a second because his name is Chocolatito Gonzalez. Yes. But Triple G hasn't been that guy, and that's okay. But it's one thing uh, to let Proxa hit you a few times. One thing to let Gabe Rosado hit you a few times. Something else entirely to let David Lemieux hit you a few times. Something else entirely. And again, this is, as you said, uh, the first time in a long time when we're going to learn something new about him. Because what we've seen is him basically fighting very similar fight. Uh, different guy, same fight, same outcome, uh, same unfolding. You know, and he beats the guy impressively and everyone says, hey, here's our next superstar. But he's winning a lot of fights kind of the same way. Uh, but this time, yeah, if he gets it, if he allows himself to get hit, or if it just happens because it's boxing, which is the more likely scenario, yeah. you know, we will see how good of a punch he takes. Well, and you know, to amend my point, I guess we'll find out one of two things. Then, a, can he take the punch, like we were saying, or b, if he has been voluntarily taking punches or has just been lax because the guys that he's been punching haven't been able to hurt him with the names that, that you mentioned. 
can he turn on some sort of defensive ability and avoid those punches right. if Lemieux proves to be a threat? We'll find out one of those two things. If he can't do either, then he'll lose the fight. Yes. But it, I will find out on Saturday night. Uh, on his undercard, we're going to see another guy who is uh, arguably one of the best fighters in the world, arguably the best fighter in the world. His name is Chocolatito Gonzalez. He's taking on Brian Valoria. We'll talk about that fight and plenty more when we return from the break right here on Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman and Morgan Campbell here with you. Sort of lost in the shuffle yes. a, a little bit in the uh, the Triple G pay-per-view is the fact that Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez will be in the co-feature taking on Brian Valoria, which is a fantastic fight. But in my opinion, uh, HBO hasn't done a tremendous job of A, selling the fact that they have arguably the best fighter in the world yes. under their umbrella right now. And number two, selling the fact that he's going to be on the pay-per-view. I know he's been included very quickly in the promos, but then when you watch the fight game with Jim Lampley last weekend... Why would you do that? I don't know why I did that, but I, I because I like talking about these things. <laughs> we need topics on this program. When you watch that... They're almost dismissive in a way of Chocolatito. At least Max Kellerman was. He said, you know, I, I don't know about putting a guy who's only 112 pounds uh, at number one in the world. I want to see him climb up the weight classes as if he hasn't moved up and been the best fighter. Did he minimum weight? Started at minimum weight, and he's been the best fighter, either linearly or the consensus best fighter in four different weight classes. I digress. Then also, why have weight classes? Why have weight classes? You know, just that's the whole point of weight. Exactly, classes. R- ridiculous. But you know, you have a platform there on your own network to sell people on this, and you really don't want to do a whole lot with it. And it, again, it goes back uh, to this this point that I still think that HBO is almost begrudgingly allowing Gonzalez and these lighter weight fighters to yes. appear on their airwaves uh, because they have to at this point because of the political divide and, and the fighters uh, in the camps that they're in with so many fighters being with Al Heyman right now, they have to dip down in the weight classes. Yes. And they're still not all the way on board with promoting these guys the way they should. Which is strange. And again, the the hardcore boxing fans or we can look at it the other way. Like mainstream boxing fans always say, well, you know, if the fighters are more interesting, we would watch more. You know, if the fighter, if the good fighters would fight each other, we would watch more. Um, if there was a compelling character, we would watch more. Um, right here we have Chocolatito Gonzalez. And it is amazing too how, you know, an HB, a, a pound for pound ranking should be, you know, apolitical. You should just be able to, 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 um, Pick it. And if you're HBO, like what are you most interested in doing? You already have Golovkin. He's already on the card. He's already um, the main event. He's already the headliner. The headline fighter in the headline fight. So what does it cost you to say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, the guy on the undercard is also uh, a really pound, good. Really good <laughs> and a pound for pound contender. It costs you nothing except that... Uh, Chocolatito climbing the, the mythical pound for pound rankings uh, might cost Golovkin a spot or two on pound for pound rankings. But like, but for me, watching Gonzalez fight, he's everything Triple G is, except he's also an incredible defensive fighter. Right, he's the rare guy who can move forward all the fight the Mexican style. I don't know how he picked it up all the way in Nicaragua because apparently the Mexican style is most popular in Kazakhstan. Yep. With Golovkin. That's where it's originated. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he's the rare guy who can move forward without really getting hit a lot. Like he picks off a lot of punches. He'll move his head. But he lands. He lands with authority. He makes the ring small. There's no running away from him. There's no backing away from him. There's no uh, drawing him into traps. Um, at least not that I've seen. You know, he does all these things very well. Um Yet somehow, because yeah. it, it doesn't take away from Golovkin, whatever greatness Golovkin has, it doesn't take away from him to praise Martinez. Yet somehow, yeah, HBO is a little bit reluctant to, 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 to give him the type of push that turns great fighters into stars and stars into superstars. And, and, and 
you know, why wouldn't you at this point? Because there's this there's this groundswell of hype about Chocolatito right now. Yes. And, you know, there's an interest in Gonzalez. And and let's be fair, the people who are going to order the Golovkin pay-per-view are mostly the boxing hardcores, or at least in the, you know, the yes. top 10% of people they, with interest in the sport. Yeah, no, they're boxing hardcores. Right. So as, they, as, as, as hard as they're pushing Golovkin right now, there aren't a lot of people who aren't super into boxing. Who are, who are building a, a, a mid-October Saturday night in the height of college football season around uh, a prize fight between a Russian and a Canadian. Exactly. I'm sorry, between yeah. a Kazakh and a Canadian. That's right. Uh, so, and, and all you have to do, apparently, all you really have to do to make this pay-per-view profitable, um, from what I've read, is sell 200,000 pay-per-views. Right. So as long as you get to 200,000, everyone walks away with a bit of money in their pocket, and everyone's fairly happy. Um, but you can do a little bit more than that. If, if and, and usually I say, hey, the undercard doesn't matter too much. And maybe it doesn't in this case, but it also can't hurt. No. Because you have Gonzalez, again, with this hype, surrounding him and you don't even have to do anything they don't have to create the Chocolatito hype because it's there everyone else is saying that he's the best fighter in the world and you just have to run with that and you know to your point you know you're making about him being everything that the Triple G is plus the defensive abilities he's also everything the Triple G is plus he's had the luxury of being able to fight all the best fighters in his division his resume yes. is what people wish that tri- Triple G would have had the opportunity to compile. And I know, you know, you know, people, maybe Max Kellerman would say, well, who has he beaten? Not my fault you haven't heard of these guys. Yes. But, tri- but Chocolatito has beaten the very best all the way from 105 all the way up to 115. And some of the best fighters in the world, he's done that. And now here he is. You have him. Do something yeah, with him. But there is this idea, one, that um, boxing kind of ends at the lower range that uh, 140 th- yeah. well that certain people deem appropriate at, at a given time and you can't possibly be skilled if you're anything if you weigh well, right. less than that yeah. so two years ago two and a half years ago boxing ended at 122 pounds because that's where Nanito was yep right yep now it's the needle's been vanquished. He's not a factor anymore. So now boxing ends at 126 because that's where Lomachenko is. Right. Right. So he can. So somehow the 126 pound guy, he he's he can go to the top of the pound for pound list. But the 112 pound guy, well, you're not top of pound for pound until you go up to 115, which again eliminates the need, eliminates the sense of having the purpose of having uh, weight classes, and eliminates the purpose of having pound for pound. Pound for pound is supposed to measure who's because obviously if they all fought. The bigger guys win. Pound for pound, supposed to tell you who's the best, who's the most skilled, regardless of yeah. size. But now you're telling me I have to be a certain size to be um, pound for pound. The other thing that I, d- I just find is mysterious is that again, in a sport that, and, and it doesn't matter how hard folks have tried to sell Golovkin up to this point, there still isn't a person uh, who, on his own, is going to fill the Mayweather Pacquiao void. There's not, no. and I don't know if there's any harm in instead of. Uh, ignoring someone's ability to possibly do that, uh, giving it a nudge and seeing who can do it. And and even if none of these guys on their own uh, draws the audience that Mayweather on his own or Pacquiao on his own when they were at their peak would have drawn, um, if two of them together can draw that type of audience, then you're a lot better off than you would be if one of them is bringing a a, a mid-sized audience and one of them is bringing a small audience. Why not help build both of their audiences so they both bring fair-sized audiences and you're still in business? Absolutely. And, you know, we're getting the rap signal, but I do want to make one point about Brian Valoria, too, that I I feel bad for him, too, because the the only uh, hype videos that I've seen of Brian Valoria being released leading up to this fight are of Brian Valoria jumping rope. Brian Valoria is a fantastic (laughs) skipper. That's all that we're telling Brian Valoria. That's all that we're telling people about Brian Valoria. Brian Valoria Valoria should have been on HBO a long time ago when Brian Valoria was was a world champion. Yes. Maybe Brian Valoria is a little bit too far past it to beat Chocolatito, but in Brian Valoria's prime, he was a world champion, yep. uh, a charismatic guy based in the United States with Filipino roots at, at, the, at the height of Manny Pacquiao yes. when there was a height of Filipino is, boxing interest, and they wouldn't put him on, and now he is on, and, and they won't do anything. Again, he, he could have he benefited the same way Daenerys did, the same way Marvin Sonsona and Anna Hulitan did. He was too light. He, he wasn't heavy enough. Filipino... A, a, a elite by even if he wasn't good, elite by association. Exactly. Boom. Well, the little guy. I'll, I'll I'll pay attention to the little guys. So will I. We have some other little guys fighting. Uh, to on the way case them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, we have some super flyweight action uh, this weekend as well in Chicago on PBC. We'll talk about that and plenty more when we come back here on Fight Network Boxing Weekly.
Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Urban alongside Morgan Campbell. Morgan, I uh, go back on the road once again this yes. week. I fly out to Chicago. We're actually both in Chicago this weekend. Yeah, exactly. But on our paths missions. will never yes. close. Yeah, we have, we have different goals. Uh, you are going to be reuniting with your uh, your football pals. Yes, at homecoming. Uh, it's the 20th anniversary. Like, little known fact, I played a little well, I, I played a little football in, in college or university, as we call it here in Canada. I was at Northwestern. Uh, the year we went to the Rose Bowl, and I was on the team the next year, too, Citrus Bowl. So it's the 20-year anniversary. Like, we're old. Yeah, where's the Although, time Although, like, we, listen, we played against Charles Woodson. He was yeah. at Michigan. He was a yeah. freshman, same year as me. And this guy's still in the NFL. You played against Plies as well. Yes, I played against Plies, the rapper. I was actually, That's right. I, 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 we didn't you, just, you were Plies. I was Ply, Plies in scout team. <laughs> um, his name was Nod Washington. He played for Miami of Ohio. So, and you know, when you're a freshman, you're on scout team. You have to put on you know, a jersey and pretend to be some guy from the other team. So I was Plies. I was number three. And I wore that jersey all week. He was actually, he's a little guy, but he's a good player. Yeah, you don't want to be Plies these days. No. Stealing cable, and, uh, you know, whatever he's doing <laughs> on Instagram. body slamming yeah, his own concerts. Yeah. Uh, you're missing out because PBC is in Chicago, yes. unfortunately. And R. Kelly is playing back-to-back nights at the Chicago Theater. So This is no country for R. Kelly. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, there's just certain stuff I can't overlook. I can watch Mayweather fight, but I cannot. You draw the line at R. Kelly. Draw the line at R. Kelly. What about Bobby Brown? You still listen to New Edition? I, of course, I still listen to New uh, Edition. But I mean, when I listen to the New Edition, Diaspora is still mostly uh, Ralph Tresvant. That's right. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, obviously, I'm going to be at uh, the PBC at the UIC Pavilion, uh, the main event of which uh, is going to be Andrew Fonfara and uh, Nathan Cleverly. The co feature is the first all Japanese world title fight on U.S. soil between uh, Kohi Kono and Koki Kameda. Of course. It's, it's got to be also the first. World title fight where the first and last name of both fighters is, is identical. K, is is K? It's the all alliterative. Yeah. World title quadruple fight. K. Yeah, it's, be the first it's, one. It's, it's lucky, gotta be lucky for that fourth K, or else it would be trouble. I might want to look that up actually. Uh, so clearly, given what happened on the last PBC broadcast that I did uh, featuring a Kameda, uh, now I'm just gonna have to score every single round for Kohi for Kohi Kono. Yes, to show people that I'm not biased towards the Kameda family. <laughs> Uh, I think that's going to be my plan uh, heading into this broadcast. Wait, wait a minute. Well, I, I love it. His last fight was against Omar Salalo. And the word Salalo in Spanish means like uh, like salty. Yeah. So he beat Salty Omar. Salty Omar. Last time out. Um, but you were saying, because there's one Kameda that's based in Mexico. Yep. But Koki so- is not... But you told me he's banned from Japan. Yeah, you so explain us why. Okay, he's so basically, from, how do you get banned from your own country? Well, almost the entire family is uh, is well, Koki in particular, but he does not there. have a license. Yeah, he's born there, but he yes. does not have a license to fight in Japan right now. So the the Kameda family uh, f- has has stirred the pot for many many years. It, it really dates back to. Uh, one of Daiki's earlier fights when he fought uh, Daisuke Nato, and both the 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 father of the Kameda family and Koki were in the corner basically tell, telling him to fight dirty, to hit Nato low, and this turned the Kameda family basically into uh, this villainous character. Okay. So the next time out, Koki fought Daisuke Nato yes. on Japanese television, on, on TBS, on the Tokyo Broadcast System right. or whatever the, uh, the <laughs> acronym is, uh, and it did a 52% share of the television audience. So they are this massive, like, villainous family and in so, Japan. I would have those guys on TV every, every week. Every single week. So, uh, but, you know, things, uh, they just kept getting into trouble. At one time, they apparently locked a member of the Japanese Boxing Commission in a locker room <laughs> and, like, held him for ransom. Uh, and all of these things have eventually snowballed and resulted in Koki not having a license to fight in Japan. He right. can't fight in Japan. So he has this grudge match with Kohi Kono, and they've been trying to find a place to put it. So okay. Thailand has been suggested. Uh, they were going to put it in Cancun. They were going to put it in Macau, in Venezuela. And now eventually, now that the Kamedas are all signed by Al Heyman, they said, all right, well, let's bring it to America where no all Japanese fight has, has ever taken place. Right. So this is very interesting. And you would think, but I was going to say you would think that they would bring a fight like this to a place outside Japan where a lot of Japanese people yes. live. Where there's like a critical mass of yep. Japanese that people. doesn't matter. No, no. no. <laughs> I, I, you know, you spent way more time in Chicago <laughs> than I have. I don't know about the uh, the Japanese demographics well, in the Windy City. Yeah, well, I mean, if you're gonna have a, an all Polish fight, it might be better to have it in Chicago. Correct. Than in Which is why Funfara Poland. continues yes, to main event he, there. He will. He he will main event there forever. He'll he, sell the place out. Listen, if 
they find Andrew Galata in Chicago and get him into shape. He could fight in Chicago and 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 maybe not sell out the U- UIC Pavilion, but he draw. Oh yeah, crowd. He, the, I'm he sure he a, would. He has a big following in that city. It's the largest Polish population any city in the world outside of Warsaw. That's right. Yeah. So, um, but I I don't know how this fight winds up in Chicago, but. Hey, listen, hey, look, I'm happy that it's happening. We were just talking about the, the lack of attention the little guys, yes. fight, foreign fighters get in particular. This is one of the benefits to PBC existing is the fact that this you would never see this fight. Yes. Clearly, this would never come to America for any reason. You would never see it on American television. If you know who these guys are, if you're boxing hardcore, uh, if you read it in the magazines or whatever, you might go out and find it on uh, on YouTube. Yes. But never otherwise. So that is one of the benefits. Uh, in the main event, you mentioned Andrew Fonfara is going to be uh, headline that show he's taking on a Nathan cleverly yes uh, cleverly trying to do something which is pretty much unprecedented so Fonfara uh, is obviously hoping for a rematch with Adonis Stevenson get another crack at the light heavyweight title cleverly made that run at cruiserweight didn't win a world title yes. there had his grudge back with which uh, with Tony Ballou, uh with Tony Bellew excuse me looked terrible is now coming back to my knowledge there are only two guys who ever moved up made a run at cruiserweight and then returned to light heavyweight to ever win uh to win a light heavyweight title and that's for Brice Tiozo and oh. Darius Mikulszewski who did it in 1994 when he quickly moved up won a cruiserweight title and then went right back down to 175 yes. uh this usually doesn't turn out well. So history is not on the side of Nathan Cleverly making this move. He turned down a fight with Jurgen Brommer to take this for more money instead. I don't know if this is going to work out the way that he wants it to. No, especially given that it's one thing to to to, to go up a weight class then back down in the weight classes that are close together. Yes. But even with the 200 pound weight limit you know, the the gap between light heavyweight and cruiserweight is the biggest in boxing. Twenty five pounds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the only thing stopping it from being another weight class and they're just they don't have enough people. Um, but to gain twenty pounds and then lose twenty pounds is is much different from you know a welterweight gaining five pounds and fighting at one fifty two in the one hundred fifty four pound class. Um, and yeah, and it hasn't you know it didn't for your man Roy Jones to go from light heavyweight to heavyweight or cruiserweight to heavy, whatever it was, because it was about a 20-pound swing that Roy Jones made. Um, and when he went back down, he was a diminished fighter. It wasn't the same. And I don't know how well this works out for um, Cleverly. Well, lucky for him, much like his uh, UK compatriot, Jamie McDonough, who has another profession, <laughs> mentioned his, uh, yes. his drywalling business and yes. whatnot. The Nathan, Cle- Nathan Cleverly uh, earned a mathematics degree uh, at Cardiff in Wales, all while he was a world champion. So okay. he, he has a math degree. He should be all right, even if this doesn't work out for him. He has something to fall back well, on. Well, I don't know what the jobs are for pure mathematicians. You know, if you'd said he had an economics degree or something like that's that, that's different. Yeah, although but you can do anything with an pure, economics. Pure math, he can always go teach math, mm. um, count his money, count the punch stats. Exactly. Go home. Yeah, he can be the new copy box. Guy. <laughs> All right, I, I don't want my man Aris to lose his job though, so uh, I, I'm not advocating for that. All right, uh, coming up, happy after birthday, the, Aris. Yes, yeah, happy birthday to Aris. As Aris well. punched at Punch His Own Aris on Twitter. He's the guy like when you watch uh, the fights and they go to the punch zone and it shows where the guy's been hit. Our, our man, Aris Pina, he's yep. the person uh, that calculates that. Happy birthday to him. History buff and New Jack Swing history buff yes. as well. So uh, he's a, a uh, beloved character here <laughs> on this program. All right, we'll be back with more boxing talk right after the break here on Fight Network Boxing. Back in Fight Network Boxing Weekly, Corey Erdman alongside Morgan you Campbell. Tell me and how graphic this stuff is. Hey, listen, man. hey, hey. <laughs> uh, by the time you're seeing this, I guess the, the PBC on ESPN card uh, will be starting in like a couple hours afterwards. Uh, but Devin Alexander is going to be making his return on the ESPN airwaves uh, against Aaron Martinez. Uh, and Morgan right now is reliving the recent homophobic tirade that Devin Alexander went on on Twitter. Uh, I, in fact, I should just correct that because most of Devin Alexander's online activities are just homophobic tirades. It's not like a one-time thing. It's like following Kurt Schilling. Right. It's just a non-stop just barrage of memes and bigotry. I just don't understand how that becomes your platform. Like, if you yourself... Why does it matter to you so much 
what two other people are doing. Neither one of them is you. So if two other people are doing this, adults, why is it your problem? Yet here's, I guess it was uh, in light of a gay marriage ruling. Yes. Yeah, in the United uh, States. Yes. There we go. It was in June. Yeah. And here's Devin Alexander tweeting, it's the the beginning of the end. Yeah. It gets better though. Uh, Of course, I'm entitled to my own opinion, which is Americans have let some stuff out the hat that's not supposed to be let out. So it's okay if it's in the hat. And this is what I don't understand about Devin Alexander's homophobia is, is this not supposed, is, is... Homosexuality not supposed to happen at all, or is it just okay if it happens? Yeah, in the you just closet? don't want to see it. Yeah, right, right. And if he doesn't want to see it, he doesn't have to see. It. There are any number of ways not to see it. Next tweet is the best though. That oh, that well, that you, one you is. Can, I can, can read, read that. that. I've read it on television. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, here we go. My mom might be watching this. Devin show. Alexander, uh, the day after this ruling came down, said only a vagina when it is stretched can tighten back up. But when your anus is stretched out, you are destroyed. Shows how unnatural it is. <laughs> Doctor De- Devin Alexander. Doctor Devin Alexander. Uh, later on, like that day, someone also tweeted it because. He actually did at like an Ask Devin, like Dr. Devin. He actually called it like Ask Dr. Devin. And someone asked him, Hey, do you have to ask a woman uh, for consent for oral sex? And he said, No. Devin Alexander uh, is, is a moron. I but don't understand. How does he know this? I don't know. He's speaking like he knows. How does he know? Has he had either of these things happen to him? Uh, I don't know. He might know them more. I want to ask him. Ask Dr. Listen, I, 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 ask Dr. I'm, I'm shocked that he's on television, to be honest. Well, it is. Because this, this did garner, uh, I wouldn't say like worldwide attention, but some mainstream sites picked it up and whatnot yes. because it was so ludicrous uh, and, and because in the wake of but the again, ruling. Because he's a boxer, like boxers, because the sport is not mainstream, can get away with stuff. Sure. That, that no one in baseball or football could dream of yet. If this was football, the homophobic, the the, a, the homophobe H would be the scarlet letter, and it would follow him. Yes, everywhere, everywhere. Well, yeah, everywhere. Because yeah. some people is still boo Yonel Escobar. Although Daniel Murphy gets lots of cheers on well, the, that's, that's that City Field. He's cool. Oh well, yeah, not everywhere. It depends <laughs> yeah. on the city you're right. playing in, right? It depends on your constituency. <laughs> but I, listen, but I, like, but there's people that still boo Yonel Escobar. That's true. Because he had on his eye black here in Toronto. Tu eres maricón. Yes. Right. And yep. there's people that still boo him over that, even though, like, if you listen to, like, teenagers, like, I was on the streetcar the other day, there's a bunch of teenagers, they were Venezuelan, because uh, one of them had the Venezuelan bag, flag baseball hat, yep. which, every, every Venezuelan, when you're born, you get two things, the cedula, which is like a social insurance number, and the Venezuelan flag <laughs> baseball hat. But they were talking, and, like, every other word was marico this, marico that, marico this, marico that. Not to say that it's right, but it's just... Among that demographic, that kind of talk is kind of normal. But still, people are like, I don't care how you talk amongst your friends. You're a homophobe. We're going to boo you every time we see you. Yeah, Devin Alexander, because it's boxing, comes, it goes. He's on ESPN. I heard they were giving away tickets to that fight. Is oh, that yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure they are giving away tickets. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how big of a draw. I mean, it's draw. also it's, it's in Phoenix. Yeah. I, how, big of a, how big of a draw is Devin Alexander? Devin Alexander could certainly draw in St. Louis. Yes. We have seen that. But take him to Phoenix, uh, it's probably not going to happen. All the Canadian retirees yeah. coming out to... Uh, Aaron Martinez, by the way, is the guy who very nearly defeated Robert Guerrero. You'll mention that he basically yes. knocked Robert Guerrero out. Yes. And then with the final right hand, managed to wake <laughs> Robert Guerrero up and then came back. I don't think he's going to beat Devin Alexander. Alexander in this fight, but again, I'm just shocked. Like, t- 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 even with everything that you're saying, I still thought that with that, nope. combined with the fact that Devin Alexander isn't particularly exciting, combined with the fact that he's coming off some losses, I thought that would have been reason enough to just keep him off of television. Because how do you avoid that in the coverage? Easily, There's although no it just never—it's never been mentioned again. Well, okay. So yeah, how yeah. often do they mention Stan Mosley and steroids? Never. Yeah, yeah. Your Good York, point. Your Yorkers Gamboa was going to the same uh, HGH dealer as Alex Rodriguez. Yeah. Alex Rodriguez, every time we see Alex Rodriguez, we talk about biogenesis. Yeah. No one's ever said anything about biogenesis in New York. No one brings up. like giant syringes <laughs> right. uh, to the crowd. All Short right. memories for this stuff, man. <laughs> All right. Coming up after, after the break, we're going to do some fun stuff. We're going to give our YouTube picks of the week. Perfect. Yes. Debuting uh, a new thing here on the program. We'll be right back here on Fight Number Boxing Weekly.
Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Yardman and Morgan Campbell here with you. We have less than two minutes left, so we want to debut something new yes. here on the program because, you know, everything around here is sort of old school. It's a little bit nostalgic, so we want yes. to help you guys out uh, who maybe haven't seen some of the older fights. There's some closet classics that we know of that maybe we want to share with you. Yes, uh, this one, uh, we're going to honor Ben Tacky in this segment since he is still <laughs> fighting. Uh, we're going to go back to some... Uh, Earlier eras yes. of boxing. So, uh, Morgan, which fight do you suggest to people to find on YouTube to go out there and watch it this week? You know what? I, I, because because this weekend is this weekend, I'm going to do two real quick. First one, because it's not super old. It's from 2012. Uh, Brian Valoria against Hernan Tyson Marquez. That's the one you alerted me to. I just remember you putting the link in my G-chat, and you're like, Morgan, watch this fight. Because fifth round of that fight is peak Marquez. When he gets... Uh, he gets um, Valoria hurt and just like rains all these arm punches on him. And you're like, you're not going to last the whole round. He doesn't last. The, well, he lasts the round, but barely. And Larry Holmes is classic on that commentary. Just the constant Larry Holmes ego stroking by Larry Holmes himself. He's, he's the worst. <laughs> the worst commentator of maybe of all time. So there's that one. Make sure you watch that one. I'll post it uh, on Twitter and on my Facebook page. Second one, um, Nigel Ben, right here. Uh, Nigel Ben versus Iran Barkley. Uh, from probably 1990, uh, very short fight, the best three minutes in boxing. Best three-minute fight ever. You can watch that during uh, the bathroom break. Exactly. <laughs> Anything you want. All right, uh, very quickly, my pick for this week, it is Troy Dorsey, Tom Boom Boom Johnson 2. Okay. It just made its way uh, onto YouTube. I found the link uh, just the other day, so it's up there. If... Uh, Chavez and Taylor Chavez and Meldrick Taylor hadn't happened that year this would have been fight of the year it wasn't broadcast nationally so you have to go check it out just a barrage of punches between two fun fighters during that era we are getting the signal though we have to get out of here it's a fantastic weekend of boxing we hope you enjoy all of it we'll see you guys next week